So this is not my story, but my boss's story. She told me the story a while ago as well, and I thought that you guys would enjoy it. So, she has four children, and when they were younger, she was driving along in one of those uh, seven-seater people carriers when it broke down on the side of the motorway. She pulled over onto the hard shoulder and put on her hazard lights, got the kids out of the car and behind the barrier, and called the AA and her husband. All the standard stuff. About 10 or 20 minutes later, a car pulls up behind her with a rather good looking chap in it. He says that he lives just off the next turning and had seen her and decided to circle back to see if she needed any help. All the way through this, my boss says that he didn't throw up any red flags. He just seemed genuinely concerned about the kids being on the side of the road and offered to take her back to his for a cup of tea to wait for the AA. He even said that you can call the AA and your husband to tell them where you are just to be safe. Again, my boss is very sweet and kind and thinks the best of people and still no red flags. She turns him down, only because she had four kids with her. She said that if she'd been on her own, she probably would have taken him up on the offer, as he seemed so genuinely kind. She turned him down because she didn't want to take the children back to the stranger's house, not because of mistrust. He sort of pushed it a little bit more and then just shrugged and left. A couple of weeks later though, she saw his photo in the paper. He had stopped to help another woman who had broken down and he had murdered her after offering her a lift. To this day, she maintains that she genuinely didn't see any red flags and the only reason she's alive is because of her kids. About 10 years ago, I was fresh out of college and trying to figure out what to do next. I went to college on an athletic scholarship and I was just as interested in enjoying my college experience as I was completing it. I ended up with a communications degree, average grades and pretty much no experience. I was working just as a door host or a bouncer at a smaller bar or lounge in a casino. I worked at said bar Wednesday to Sunday from around 7pm to 3am. My job was basically to just greet people coming in, check IDs, break up fights, and remove people who got out of hand while maintaining a professional and friendly manner. Now, there was a man that started coming into the bar on the off nights, Wednesday or Thursday when it was slow. He would come in both nights one week and then not come in again for three weeks or so, and then he would do the same thing always on the off nights. Usually he would talk to me a couple of times throughout the night when he was just there, just normal small talk. It was never awkward too, and he was always well dressed in a suit or at least a button up shirt and slacks. He was clean, had an athletic build, no visible tattoos or piercings, and a shaved head. Now, I'm not into men, but I would guess that he was a good looking man in his late 30s. And well, the last night I saw him, the conversation was a, a bit different. So, he came in on an off night like normal and eventually came up to talk to me by the door. The conversation started off normal, but eventually he asked me if I enjoyed what I did at the bar. I did the typical, it's not that bad, it's mostly easy, dissembling what I felt was polite conversation. He asked me how long I'd been a bouncer for, asked if I thought about making any more money, and eventually dragged out of me that, no, I didn't particularly enjoy being a bouncer and didn't know what I was going to do with my future. And at this point, he looked me straight in the face and said... Well, you could kill people. While maintaining our eye contact, I paused and waited for some type of joke or smile or something that would turn this into a failed attempt at a joke. But no, there was nothing. He seemed 100% serious and there was no smile, no joke, nothing but him just staring at me, waiting for me to respond. At this point, I tried to tell him the first thing that came to mind. I said... Uh, I'm pretty sure I don't have the skill set for what I think you're suggesting. He said, Yeah, but you could learn all about that. Think about it. You could travel, work once or twice a month, and get paid really well. Well, strangely, at that point in my life, it was an intriguing idea. I immediately thought of some sort of police setup and all the shadowy hitmen handle the betrayals that I've seen in every hitman movie ever. So, I told him... Nah, I just don't think that's for me. And then he said, okay, and just left. And I worked there for another year and I never saw him again.
I want to preface this story by stating that I've had my fair share of encounters with creepy men. This situation, however, scared the life out of me and it's the first time that I genuinely felt like my life was in danger. So my husband and I had to drive 17 hours last week to North Carolina for a wedding. It was an exhausting week and we basically spent the entire time just rushing from one family gathering to another. We were staying in a motel for the time that we were there and we had already been at this motel for a few days by the time that the day of the actual wedding rolled around. The day of the wedding was absolutely hectic. We were rushing around trying to get ready to leave for the venue and my husband got ready before me so he could do some last minute things before we had to leave and that left me alone in our motel room to get ready before he returned. It was brutally hot outside and I decided to do my hair and makeup in just my underwear so I wouldn't be sweating in my nice dress the whole time. The way that this motel was laid out, the sink and mirror were in the general open area of the room with the toilet and the shower in another room. So, anyone walking by our window could see me standing at the mirror. However, I did have the curtains closed, but these curtains were a little bit sheer, so you could technically see the shadow of someone walking by on the outside. Or could maybe see the silhouette of me inside the room as well. So, I was curling my hair in the mirror when I noticed the silhouette of a man walking by the room window. As he's passing my window, I see him stop and start trying to look into my window. At first, I thought it was my husband trying to see if I was ready, so I paid it no mind. But the longer the guy stood there, bobbing his head around trying to get a better look through the curtains, I began to realize that it was not my husband. Because, obviously, why wouldn't he just come in? Now I'm starting to get a little bit freaked out, I must admit, but before I could do anything... I watch as this guy starts to go for my room door. My utter shock and horror came when he actually was able to open the door too and walked inside. Before my husband left, he'd obviously forgot to pull the door shut all the way till it clicked into its lock. He was really upset with himself when I told him this later as well. So now I'm face to face with this man and I'm in my underwear no less, who's at least six feet tall and just standing in my room. I thought to myself, this is it, he's going to attack you. That's a very scary realization to have, I tell you, and I also thought to myself, you're going to have to burn his eye sockets out with this curling iron if you want to survive. For a few seconds, probably only a second or two, but it felt a lot longer. He just stood there staring at me like I was a piece of meat and he was starving, ready to pounce on me like prey. He then began to smile the most evil looking toothy grin that I've ever seen and started mumbling something under his breath. I didn't make out what he was saying completely, but I did make out the words pretty lady and come here. I don't know if it was the fight or flight response, but I suddenly got pissed and I charged towards him, ready to strike him with the hot curling iron. I screamed as loud as I could, get the hell out of here. It must have startled him because he jumped back out onto the balcony of the motel. I saw this as my chance and I ran for the door. I luckily was able to get to the door and slam it shut right before he was able to make his second attempt at entering inside. I immediately collapsed on the floor just sobbing after this and I was literally too scared to move from that spot until my husband came back about 15 minutes later. I told him the whole thing and he was obviously freaked out. He initially wanted to find the guy so that he could beat the crap out of him but I refused to let him leave my side. He must have apologized a thousand times during the rest of our trip for not making sure that the door was locked before leaving. But I told him that the day and that whole trip really was so rushed that I could see how it happened. We eventually went to the motel management and told them the whole story and the police were obviously called and I gave them a description of the guy so that they could see if there was someone who was staying in the motel that looked like that. After going around to the few motel occupants, they said that no one matched his description and concluded that he wasn't staying here. Obviously, we were late to the wedding that day and the whole experience just ruined what should have been a really happy time. We planned on staying another day before our long drive home, but we both just wanted out of there as soon as possible at that moment. So we skipped most of the reception and we went back to the motel, packed up and we just left. I am usually always so vigilant with locking my doors, especially when I'm home alone. It just goes to show you, I guess, that all it takes is that one time that you forget to check your locks, and that certain unwanted guest is inviting themselves right in.
About a year and a half back, I was a sheriff's deputy that had been transferred to the jail division. I started out on night shift, and being the most recent addition, I spent a lot of nights in the housing bubble. Sometimes I would be sitting there after lights out and I would see out of the corner of my eye the orange striped shirt of an inmate running by housing. I would think to myself, why is the inmate worker just messing around like that? Then I would realize that I didn't have an inmate worker that night. Or on occasion, I could swear that I saw someone walking on the upper level of one of the pods as well. I got to a point where I would honestly just blow it off as me being overly tired but then one night, something happened that I just couldn't brush off anymore. So I was sitting in the back of the housing watching YouTube. I would usually watch cops after lights out. And well, I started hearing tapping. Like someone was tapping their fingers on the control desk. A steady and yet quick three taps and then three taps again and again. And I'm thinking to myself, what's wrong with the computer? Why is it making that noise? So I'm staring at the main desk and the trash can underneath the desk just flips up about five inches from the ground and moves to the side about a foot and then sits back down, like someone was moving it out of their way. And I just kind of sat there. I didn't have any feelings of dread or fear. It almost felt like just another deputy was in there with me. I really don't feel like whatever it was meant me harm, but it was definitely an interesting moment to say the least. I had gone to bed for the night, but since I'm a pretty light sleeper, the sound of thunder awoke me about every hour. Around 3am, I decided that I just wasn't going to get much sleep tonight, and went downstairs to get a cup of water. I remember a strange feeling that night, like the air was charged, which I figure was probably just related to the storm. I make my way slowly down the steps, not wanting to wake my family. I enter into the dining room, which consists of a large table in the center of the room. Avoiding the table, I step to the left when a sudden flash of lightning illuminates the room. And that's when I notice the man standing not even one foot further to the left in the very corner of the dining room, looking down on me. He was white with black hair and, well, piercing blue eyes that glowed even after the lightning went out. He was well dressed and didn't seem to be wearing anything that struck me as out of place for the time period. It was his smile, though, that just made my blood run cold. He was grinning from ear to ear as if he was happy to see me, yet a negative energy just seemed to envelop the room. I was frozen from fear, unable to move and unable to think, unable to scream, and all I could do was watch as the blue eyes seemed to slowly melt into the wall until there was just no trace that the man had even been there. I scrambled back up the stairs, locked my door, and hid until morning, but I was unable to shake the feeling of just being watched the whole night. Daylight eventually came and I checked the whole house for the strange man that I'd seen the night before, but he had vanished. There hadn't been any kind of break-in and nothing was taken and oddly my family security system was still perfectly intact and nothing had been tripped. I'm a foreign student studying in a small town in Germany. At the time this particular event happened, however, I was still living in Berlin. I lived in an older apartment with an older lady who rented the unit to me. The kitchen connected the two apartments that she owned, so we technically live in separate units, but we share the kitchen. The star of our story, however, is not the lady. She's really nice, and I still even talk to her sometimes. The apartment building, though, is five stories high with a staircase, no elevator. But we live in the second story. The lady who rented the unit to me, though, has always had a problem with the neighbors right downstairs because they were always noisy and they fought a lot and when they were on their balcony, it always smelled heavily of smoke. The neighbors downstairs are an older couple, probably in their late 50s or early 60s if I had to guess. I didn't know much about them except for their phone number and their names, which the landlady scribbled on a piece of paper for me in case they ever got too loud so I could call them. It turns out, I never needed the number to get to know them because one afternoon, as I was cooking, the doorbell in the lady's apartment rang, but she was out. And not long after that, it rang on my side. So I thought it must be her trying to reach out or something, so I looked at the peephole and... There stood some older lady, so I thought it must just be the landlady's friend. I opened the door, and to my surprise, 
there stood the said lady without any pants. As in, she was with a shirt but was in her underwear. Now, at that point, I was only in Germany for a couple of months, so I wasn't really sure if this was normal and my German was not also that good. This lady was mumbling something that I could barely make out, but since she rang the bell on the landlady's side first, I assumed she was looking for the landlady and I tried telling her, with the best German that I could, that the landlady was out and will probably not be back until later. But this lady, she just stood there mumbling something. I really couldn't understand her, so I just shook my head apologetically and smiled. She began gesturing to me to come with her like she wanted to show me something. So I quickly turned off the stove and I followed her downstairs after grabbing my keys. She then started to ring a bell on the door right below us. And it was at this point that I was like, ah, oh, so this is the neighbor. But then came another wave of shock because after she repeatedly rang the bell, a man came to the door with no piece of clothing on except for his socks. I tried really hard not to make my weirded out face very apparent because I wasn't sure about German customs yet at that point and I didn't want to be rude. And all I could think about was, so this must be the husband. She gestured for me to come in and I was starting to wonder what her actual intention in calling me all the way down here was. I thought it was something important for the landlady but she just offered me something to drink and... I declined, but she insisted on getting me water anyway and walked into the kitchen. Now, I'm still standing near the front door with this man who is now staring at me top to bottom. To be honest, he looks kind of drunk and right at that moment, I remembered how the landlady used to tell me that all they do is fight and get drunk. So I just smiled at him and stood there awkwardly, but he decided to suddenly be very friendly because... He kind of just grabbed my shoulder and dragged me inside of the house to show me different rooms and the balcony and their small garden and everything. I mean, the house itself is beautiful, I must admit. A real contrast to the people living in it. It was very uncomfortable though, to say the least, because he was very much naked still and staying at a very close proximity to me. His arm was on my shoulders and he was just looking at my face so closely that I could feel his breath on my face. He then proceeded by asking if they had a beautiful garden and I just said yes and kind of laughed awkwardly. Thank God the wife came out from the kitchen at this point and then she started shouting at him for doing what he was doing. She told him that it was no way to treat a guest and she handed me a glass of water all the while still wearing no pants. I never drank the water and I quickly excused myself saying that I needed to check my cooking upstairs. After some debate, I got out of the house, but the lady is still holding on to me at the door, pleading that I could stay a while and sit at the garden with her. I was ready to come up with more excuses before someone came through the front door of the building and interrupted. It was the young man that lives two stories above us. Apparently, he just got back from grocery shopping and he somehow dealt with them and told me to go back upstairs. So I went and waited upstairs to thank him. He was done talking to them after about two minutes and he came upstairs to ask if I was alright and told me not to get mixed up with those folks because they're apparently known to be very problematic. So yeah, he saved my day and I thanked him for that. After that experience though, I kind of just hurried my way up to my apartment every time that I got back from somewhere so I didn't run into them. I actually met her once more after that. She looked sober and was actually wearing pants this time. She didn't seem to recognize me though and thankfully I have since moved far away from there. So I've shared before one of my more recent experiences and I experienced that activity in my family's last house that was so bad that we actually had to move out in the end. So I figured that I should share a few more of the stories. So the house was normal at first, but the first thing that really was a red flag were the footsteps. They'd usually happen when only one person was home. I remember hearing them multiple times. It sounded like someone walking and sometimes even running down the small upstairs hallway that led to my sister's bedroom. But one day, I was at summer school in the middle of the day, about 1pm, and I get a text from my sister asking if I've heard footsteps upstairs. I tell her yes, and... She tells me that she thinks she's hearing them but doesn't respond after that. After I get home, my mum tells me that she came home to my sister sitting outside the house. 
Apparently, she had heard loud footsteps and went upstairs to investigate, finding my parents' bedroom door open. This is strange too because my mum always closes it before she leaves the house. My sister then closed the door, only to hear what sounded like loud running coming from inside the room. And needless to say, that was enough to scare her straight outside. About a few months pass and the footsteps are a common phenomenon at this point. My mum tells me that my sister's phone even got flung off her bed by itself at one point. But anyways, it's late at night and I normally get up to get some water or snacks. My bedroom is the only one downstairs, everyone else is asleep upstairs. The kitchen is only three or four feet from my room. I open my door and I'm basically just standing there and after walking in the pantry light is on which is odd because my dad would always turn it off before he went up to bed. I brushed it off though as maybe one of my sisters went and got some food, same idea as me. I step into the pantry to see what snacks we have available when I hear a drawer open. I can hear the wheels hit the end of the track and some metal clang around briefly, meaning the drawer had been pulled open all the way. I pick my head out and sure enough the silverware drawer is wide open. I close that drawer and then I just ran back to my room. Weird occurrences continued and my mum constantly complains how lights in her bedroom will turn on by themselves and she'd even see a shadow of a little girl running around her bed. The master bedroom seemed to be a hotspot for activity and I had no idea what people meant when they said that they felt that they were being watched until being in that room. I always had the urge to look into the mirror or check over my back. You could just kind of tell that something was there. It's hard to explain, but if you've experienced it, you'll know what I'm talking about. And this comes into play late one night too. So, I'd been over at a friend's house the next city over, about a 15 minute drive. I often get home late and everyone's asleep. It's about 11.30, so I quietly unlock the door and walk in when I see my mum standing in the front room holding one of our dogs. My mum is usually out by nine and very rarely gets up and leaves a room, which meant that something strange was definitely happening. And she tells me that she saw a huge shadow figure, like a full man standing in the hall that leads to her bathroom. Also, for whatever reason, she left my little sister in the master bed by herself and my dad was asleep on the couch. I can't just leave her in there if there's some huge shadow man, demon or poltergeist or whatever it is in there with her. So I go back upstairs with my mum and check on my sister. She's fast asleep and my mum is visually shaken and points out that her shower door was not open when she left the room. Sure enough, it was pulled wide open at this point. Eventually, we all just went to the bed, there's nothing we can really do, and we just try to forget it. I have a few more stories if anyone wants to hear them. I strongly believe that my family is followed by something, but I can't be too sure. When I was 14, I was taking 3D modeling class at my online school and had a teacher whom I'll call John Doe for the sake of privacy. He was around 60 at the time and John Doe was a little, well, friendly. He would always ask to Skype and would talk about subjects unrelated to school. If I only had my audio on, he'd ask for me to turn on my video. He'd also ask me to lower my camera when I was wearing tank tops and whatnot. He'd say that I was the most beautiful girl in Hawaii and would tell me how lovely I looked and be very complimentary. He sort of opened up to me as well in a way that was unusual for a teacher to do so. He also always gave me A pluses so I appreciated that but I knew something was weird when I never had an imperfect score ever. My 14 year old self had never had someone open up in that way so I just went along with it. It actually kind of intrigued me if I'm being honest. I didn't mind too because he always gave me perfect grades and was always flattering towards me. He'd look at my chest when we were on Skyping and would always compliment my physical appearance. He'd say that we should meet sometime in person and asked where I lived. He'd say that he'd swing by even though I was far too young to just hang out and talk. He said that he'd love to see me in person and that just never really materialized though. So this complimentary behavior in Skyping though, it went on for months until... He just randomly disappeared from school and Skype. 
I started researching his name and found out that he had commented on girls around my age's YouTube accounts with similar jargon. I don't know the reason as to why he was dropped or resigned from the school. All I know is that he was. And I never heard from him again or of him again. When I was that age, I didn't think anything was wrong with his behavior, but now I feel it's apparent that it was definitely inappropriate. And I'm glad that nothing happened. This story happened when I was 12 years old. I'm female and 25. And I remember that it was a Saturday night around 9 or 10 p.m. during summertime. I owned one dog at the time. His name was Benny. My parents decided that night they feel like going for a walk around the block, walking Benny and asked me whether I wanted to join them. I said no because I wanted to play PWI on my PC, Perfect World International. My parents were okay with leaving me alone since the walk wouldn't take longer than 30 minutes tops. As my parents would get dressed to leave the house, I logged into PWI and looked around at my guild and global chat to see if anyone was on. For some reason, no one was, so I decided to join my parents. I get dressed, I put Benny on his leash, and we all leave. I'd like to mention too that I lived in an apartment building that had 10 floors and we lived on the first floor. I'm not really sure how to explain it too, but you have the basement of the building and then the first row of the apartments. But basically, you enter the building and you're already facing apartments, and I lived in the very first one. I remember always hating that too, because whoever would pass by our door, we would hear them at any time of the day or night. Whoever was lurking at night, we would hear them as well, and it was somewhat eerie to live on floor zero. Anyway, we leave the house and my dad closes the door. We had three keyholes and a steel bar that would block the door from the inside. The bar covered half of the door. Precautions were my father's obsession. We exit the building and enjoy our walk. After 15 minutes, we realize that the wind has changed from warm summer wind to incoming storm wind. My mum makes the call to go back home as Benny already did all of his duties, so we all return. We open the building door, climb the five stairs to our door and attempt to open it and my father does the following. He unlocks the first three locks and then attempts to unlock the metal door that holds the door locked. And at that attempt, my father pauses, turns around at us with the most serious face that I've ever seen on him and whispers for us to call the police and ring the neighbor's door. My mum goes to the second apartment and the neighbor, who I'll call Ted, comes out asking my father what had happened. My dad whispered to him, covering the see-through hole of the door, that someone was in our house. He or they are holding the door. Please stay here with my family and make sure not to open it. I'll be back. After saying that, I see my father rush all by himself around the building in the dark. I say dark because we didn't have any streetlights on the side of our apartment facing the block garden. But my dad disappears into the darkness and I go outside too, not following him too much but only to hear if he's in trouble. He's my dad, don't judge me. And as soon as I get out, I hear him shout, Hey you, come back. Who the hell do you think you are? I've called the police. At the same time I hear him shout, I look at Ted who manages to open the door and enter the house at that point and I go after them and enter my house. It no longer felt like my house too because in just 15 minutes while we were walking... The home invaders made a complete mess of our house. All of our shelves and wardrobes were pulled out, our clothes scattered just all over the house. Benny's dry food was all over the floor, indicating that they must have tripped in his bowls or something, probably not knowing that we owned a dog. But what scared me the most was how organized they were. I say they too because after seeing the disaster that was left behind... We knew that it was pretty much impossible for just one person to hold the door, steal, and organize what they would want to take with them. I also say organize because the thieves put in our living room, all packed and ready, what they wanted but couldn't steal. On the couch, they placed our laptops, one of our TVs, my father's collections of coins, our phones, chargers, wallets, and even my father's camera. He's a photographer, and that week he had to attend a wedding. They didn't have enough time to steal all of that, so they just settled with one of my mum's jewellery and pocket money and whatnot. After seeing this, in my silly child mind, I rushed to my room to check my piggy bank. I always saved up money from whatever chores I did. 
It wasn't much, but it was my work and savings, and at that time, I thought that they stole it too. When I enter my room, I see the metal bars covering my windows, my cut open, and my windows broken, which means that this is how they entered, through my room. My room is the only room facing the side of the building, and the one most secluded from views. Needless to say, I never felt safe in my room in which I had to live for the next 10 years of my life in until I moved into my own place with my fiancé. The police arrive though and they start throwing white dust. I have no idea what it actually is, but it was all over our house to find fingerprints. They take pictures, take our statements, analyze my room and window. They were unable to catch the home invaders, but were able to tell that this invasion was not the only one in our neighborhood. During that month, allegedly, another four houses were broken into, one of them being the home of a cop, not related with the cops at our home. They told us that the invaders analyzed their victims, learned their schedule, even knew where the children's rooms were, as they seemed to be entering the houses through the children's windows. All the families affected by them had children. But they didn't expect us to be back that soon and panicked, hence one of them was holding the door with his body so the others could flee. The person after which my dad was shouting was probably the one holding the door and escaping last through my broken window. I don't know what could have happened if I didn't change my mind and give up on raiding for gears and PWI. I would probably have come face to face with these invaders and I'm really happy that I didn't and I hope to God that I never meet them again. So this happened about two years ago now. I got divorced and moved in with my mum on our family farm in rural South Georgia. The house we moved into was my grandmother's childhood home. It's huge and surrounded by our produce fields. When I first moved with my boys, age two and four at the time, they honestly loved it. It has so many rooms and had so much more space to run and play than our crappy little apartment in Orlando. As time went on though, they started saying little things such as, there are monsters upstairs. And the funny thing is, every morning I would shut the doors upstairs, they unsettled me too. Every morning I would wake up and they would be open again. I always chalked it up to the old house just having drafts. But eventually the boys didn't like being alone in certain rooms or in the house alone at all. During the time I spent there I did notice little things. And now that I look back I think they must have seen more than I did. After about two years though, I finally found a good man. Well, we started off slow with small little casual dates. He even included the boys, which was very surprising and different. We were inseparable, even if it was just sitting around the house. One night though, we decided to sit outside and talk. The boys and my mum were inside asleep. My room was across the house, so we decided to call my phone and put it on speaker. We muted his phone and also put it on speaker. We sat on the porch and we talked for hours until early in the morning, when all of a sudden we both froze mid-conversation because we could hear a man speaking through the phone in my bedroom. He isn't saying something that we can make out, but the voice is terrifying. But the creepy thing is that my son is sleepily mumbling back to the man. It was at this point that we both just looked at each other and took off, bursting into the house to find both of my boys still sound asleep and the room silently empty. I don't know why, but it bothers me after all these years. Because who was talking to my son that night? This event took place not too long ago. It happened on a Wednesday night when me and my best friend decided to go clubbing. Neither of us are actually club people, but it was free for ladies and a local rock band was performing. They're pretty famous around here, so we figured why not? It's been a while since we've gone out at night anyway. Nothing particularly interesting happened at the club as it was heavily overpopulated. But when the show was over, we decided to leave as it started getting even more populated with new people coming in. It was hard to keep up a conversation because we literally had to scream over each other and, in worst cases, even push to get past the mass. So instead, we just walked around the old town and chit-chatted a bit. The old town was fairly quiet, except for the few ambulances trying to aid a drunk guy who hit his head on the pavement or something. 
After a while, we both decided to just go home and I had to get a taxi because it's quite a long trip, one hour at least, and there's no way that I was going to walk this path alone as it tends to get quite dangerous at night. She lived closer to the city centre and in another direction, so she decided to just walk home instead. After I had ordered my taxi, we parted ways and I had to wait 10 minutes at least, so I decided to sit down on a bench nearby the bus stop and this is where it began. So I was scanning the area when I glanced over to the bus stop on the other side of the road and I noticed a dark greyish SUV parking right next to it. Right as I looked towards it, he started waving for me to come closer. I was confused and looked around again to see if there were more people around and when I glanced again he tried to pull the same gesture but I didn't respond like before and that's when he slowly started to drive. I had a bad gut feeling instantly kick in and then he pulled right up next to me as I feared. He rolled his windows down and yelled, I'm Ricardo. I'm not even sure if that's his real name. The guy seemed to be way older than me, almost twice my age in fact. He appeared to be in his late 30s or early 40s and seemed to be either Puerto Rican or perhaps Colombian or something. Now, I know sometimes people tend to pick others up if their destination is on their radar but... I had a strong gut feeling that he had other things in mind. When I told him that I was waiting for a taxi, he kept insisting that I should cancel it and get in his car. He also called me baby a few times and the red flags definitely kicked in even more at this point. He asked for my name and I blurted out a random name that popped up in my head at the time. He took out his hand and wanted to shake hands and I stood up slowly but something just told me not to do it. And that was when I got a small peek into his car and I'm pretty sure that there appeared to be some sort of ropes or wires on his back seat. And there was also a silver light slightly shining from a back seat in what I assumed to be duct tape. I immediately froze and told him that I'd rather not get too close with strangers. He tried to reassure me that he was a good guy and wouldn't hurt me. He started getting frustrated at this point and for some reason he thought that if he would say things like, but you're so beautiful baby, at least twice, that I'd cool down and just get into his car or something. But no way was I ever going to get in with him. He seemed to get angry now but as it took place in the city center and there were quite a few cars and other people around, he just asked me if I was sure for the last time as if he'd hope I'd change my mind or something to his offers that he made and... I blew him off for the last time and that's when he finally left. He didn't even say goodbye or anything too, just kind of drove off like the wind. That's when I realized that he must have been waiting in that spot where I first had noticed him. I didn't see any cars passing by while I was sitting at the bus stop and it's also the exact spot where most people would go after a night out to order a taxi or perhaps go to McDonald's, whatever floats their boat. The club is located just southeast from the bus stop. A lot of girls were wasted that night, so he most likely wanted to take advantage of that too. When the taxi finally arrived, I texted my best friend. And I froze when she texted me that a creepy guy in a large SUV had stopped and mumbled something to her, and she ignored him and just kept on walking. Apparently, he attempted to follow her and kept shouting something, but since she had earphones on, she couldn't really make out what he was saying. When she ran in between the houses, he was gone. Luckily, she got home safely and so did I. But I guess the moral of the story is always be aware of your surroundings and listen to your gut feeling. I'd like to think that I was just overreacting, but something tells me that it would have been very different if we were in a more private and secluded area. Several years ago, I was working in a shopping mall as a marketing manager, and my job was very much in the public eye in my community. My main job was to get people into the shopping center, mostly by hosting events such as fashion shows, music events, and beauty pageants, mostly that I presented myself as well, so I was well known around town. Now, I had a group of friends that I had known since high school, and we saw each other pretty regularly. But when I was around 29, I had been married for four years and had just had my son. My friend Chrissy, not a real name by the way, had unfortunately just ended her second marriage. It was a running joke in the group that she really liked wedding cakes. 
She had just hooked up with a new man as well and wanted us to get together that weekend so she could introduce him. And in typical Chrissy fashion, there was around a month in time moving from husband number two to moving in with new man Jake. Again, not his real name. The meeting went off without an issue and we all attended, muttering between ourselves that it would never last. He was a lot older than she was, himself, recently divorced with a very interfering ex as well. He was also definitely no oil painting. Around three weeks after though, Chrissy announced that she was pregnant. One day I walked into my office at the shopping mall to find a large bunch of roses and a teddy on my desk though. I received flowers regularly from suppliers, so it wasn't really a surprise, but the teddy was definitely new. I am not, and I never have been a teddy kind of girl. The small card just said, I can't wait to see you again. I asked the secretary if she knew where they came from, and she said that she had no clue. They were delivered to the security office before any of us arrived. And it was at this time that the phone calls started direct to my office phone skipping the reception only a few people knew this number and at first there were just silent calls with just heavy breathing on the line after a few days of silence he started to talk things like i'm watching you i like your skirt you're beautiful i wish you were my girlfriend each time i slammed the phone down the voice was gravelly though and sounded as if the person was trying to make his voice deeper than it was after daily calls for a week, I went to my boss who had the number changed and the calls thankfully stopped after this. Around a month after this, we hosted a get-together at my house and Chrissy and Jake attended. As he walked through the door and greeted me, I froze. As soon as he spoke, I knew immediately that it was him. But Chrissy was by now very pregnant and I really didn't want to upset her, so I never told her. I confronted him about it and he apologized and said that he didn't mean to creep me out. They left early that day and they moved to another town a few months after. The marriage did happen and I was invited but I declined. The marriage lasted a year and Chrissy is now engaged again. In fact, she has been three times since her and Jake divorced. I did tell her about it a few years later and she said that she understood me not telling her at the time. She would have not believed me anyway. He must have got my number from her address book or something, and he had apparently done this to another woman at their church straight after they moved. I've worked night audit for a new Bampton in one of the safest areas near me for a little over two years now. It's got direct access to two main highways. I've had a fair share of creepy guests and weirdos, but most were just easy check-ins and fixes, and then they're on their way. However, last night changed everything up. As safe as my property is, we do have a shady $40 a night motel on the other side of our building. There's been some stuff that's gone down at both places, and occasionally their guests try to sneak into my motel for a free breakfast. I have on two occasions seen the police raid both hotels and spend all night searching for people who ran and collected evidence, I presume. It's been a while since I've seen such entertainment though, so that's been nice. But anyway, it's about 2.30am and I'm getting ready to run my night audits. My doors are locked and this guy who is dirty but in a construction worker kind of way walks up. We have plenty of construction workers stay here as we aren't far from their site and we're rated number one in the area so I open the door for him and ask if he needs a room before I run the audit. He grins at me but it's anything but a warm welcome. It looks fake and almost threatening in fact and he looks at me for a second and then says that I have a guest in room 144. His wording caught me off guard. Not many say that they have a guest in a room. It's usually I'm here for or I'm meeting so-and-so. And the second issue is that we don't have a room 144 and neither do any of the brand names in my area. I've been to all the immediate ones so I inform him that we don't have a room 144 and he looks at me for a second and then says, Oh shucks, guess I got stood up. Giggles and then just walks out the door. But thinking that this is very odd, but whatever, I go back to running the audit. As I'm finishing up, the phone rings and 
My guy starts chuckling and says that there's a car in your parking lot with its lights on. Oh, and by the way, I'm the guy that just got stood up. Now, one, it's been 30 minutes since he walked out my door. Why is he still in the parking lot? And two, nobody has come or gone since him and there were no lights on in the parking lot before he came in. And three, why do I need to know that you're the guy who got stood up? I brush it off as odd, but my gut is telling me that something weird is going on. I wait about five minutes and then walk around the front of the building from the inside and see no cars in my parking lot with lights on. It's not very well lit, so it would be easy to spot. Back at the front desk, waiting for the order to finish up its thing so I can get ready to start breakfast, and the phone rings again. I pick it up and... It's the creepy guy again telling me that there's a light on in the parking lot. It's been at least another 20 minutes since the last call, so again, why would he still be in the parking lot? I feel I may have missed something between the windows, so I go to my locker door, peek my head out real quick to do a swift scan of the lot, and my eye catches someone standing in the corner of the parking lot. It's the creepy guy, and he's just squatting there, watching me. There's also no car with its lights on, and I run back inside, double check that the doors are locked, and I start to feel this sense of panic and something really bad is about to happen. I have never felt this feeling while on my shift, and only once before in my life, and let's just say I have physical scars from what happened that time. So I get back to the front desk and I call the local PD and I explain the situation to dispatch, and they ask if it's ever happened before. I tell them no, but also inform them that I'm the only employee on the property and I would like for them to scan the parking lot and check in with me if possible. PD pulls up and wants to get a description from me before searching the area. And well, as he's getting out of the car, he notices movement. Creepy guy took off. The cop walks in a little nervous and tells me what he just saw while using his radio to call for assistance. Three more show up and they discuss it, searching my parking lot and the two neighbor parking lots. They seem to come up with nothing, but stick around to patrol the parking lot until the sun came up. PD has stopped by once since my shift started tonight to check on me and said that they would be in the area if I needed anything. And while here, they tell me that a total of three guys fled the parking lot from different directions last night. He believes that the creepy guy was trying to lure me into the parking lot, away from the door so that I would end up trapped between the three of them. He didn't go much further as to what could have happened from there, but honestly, I don't want to dwell on it either. I was 13 years old in 2003 and my friend and I were bored and decided to have some weird fun one night. Now, I've always had interest in the supernatural and occult-like things. I've always been very empathic and in tune to things in a way that's hard to explain. But anyways, I didn't have a real Ouija board, so we used paper and drew one and then used a quarter for the planchette. Well, we asked if anyone was there and if they wanted to talk. Nothing, of course, for a few minutes, when suddenly, the feathers on my dreamcatcher in my room started to sway. With no window or air conditioner on, too. We asked again if anyone was there, when suddenly it felt like there was a pull. But we allowed ourselves to let go and just see what happened, and it went to yes. We asked what its name was, and we felt pulled towards D and C, just the letters D and C, which was odd. A minute or so later, my grandma called for us that she was ready to go as we were about to go to the mall. We stood up and walked out of my room. My friend looked at my face and gasped and told me to look in the mirror. And I had a two inch or so scratch on my face that definitely wasn't there before. We were a little freaked out but mostly confused. But we went shopping and my grandma asked us what happened and I told her that I really didn't know. The next morning the scratch was gone too but after that night things got pretty weird. So my room for some reason started to feel colder than the rest of the house. Even my grandma commented a few weeks later that my room was just cold as death. My dog stopped coming into my room as well. He would stand at my doorway and I would call for him and he would just look at me and then leave. He might come in rarely for a minute or so, but he would never stay. 
And then I started to get feelings like I just wasn't alone in there. The air felt thicker, the dark seemed darker, and when I was home alone, I would hear things, footsteps and creaking. One night, though, it all came to a head. My grandparents went out to dinner and I stayed home. I was downstairs playing on the desktop and instant messaging my friend. The bathroom door next to me that had been shut tight made a clicking sound and the knob had turned and the door opened slowly. I got up and slammed it shut and I went back to playing my game and instant messaging when I heard a loud crash. I got up and saw my grandma's crucifix that had been hanging on the wall had crashed to the floor. I put it back and turned on as many lights in the TV and just took my mind off of it all. Around this time, my grandma, who is very Catholic, started getting into more new age things like crystals and psychics and whatnot. She went to, she went to one and the psychic told my grandma that she had a granddaughter who saw orbs, but that these orbs that I'd been seeing were angels protecting me. It is true that I'd been seeing a lot of flashing lights that I called orbs in those months. Fast forward a year or so and some things happened to me that I won't go into here depression and hospitalizations and boarding schools. When I got home from boarding school, my grandma told me that she had spent a night in my room. She had laid down to sleep and suddenly heard a creaking noise. She said that she remembers thinking to herself, please don't start playing music. And then my music box just started playing. She said that she bought a lot of different incense and played a special prayer on repeat for days and basically prayer bombed the whole house. And when I returned home, my room just felt clean, like whatever had been there was gone, and it was safe. I stopped seeing orbs after that too, and I never played with a Ouija board again, but I do love the designs, I admit. I have a Ouija board mug and a Ouija board mat on my dresser. I like the symbol and I'm not afraid of them, but I will never use one again, that's for sure. I'll admit though that I've been tempted through the years to try again, hoping that maybe being better prepared I can have a safer outcome, but I just don't know if I want to take that chance of opening a door to any stranger knocking. If anyone here has had any experiences, I would sure love to hear them as well in the comments below. Thanks for listening. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and if you would like to help me out, then please go ahead and watch another video by clicking on a card on the screen. As always guys, thanks for all the love and support, and I'll see you mates in the next one.